So you've bought your DSS, and now you have access to two great programming choices, DirecTV and USSP. These are two completely separate programmers. You can subscribe to either carrier or both, and you don't need to receive one to get the other. DirecTV provides news and informational programming, sports packages, and pay-per-view movies. And for the ultimate movie experience on TV, U.S. Satellite Broadcasting brings the best selection of the highest quality movies all in one place, all at one price, and all in the comfort of your own home. As a new DSS owner, you're entitled to one free month of USSB Entertainment Plus. USSB Entertainment Plus is yours to enjoy, free, for one month. No strings attached. It's the most unbelievable entertainment package featuring multiple channels of HBO and Showtime, structured and programmed to bring you more movie choices than ever before. You'll experience more entertainment variety and choice than ever, all in one place and all for one price. You'll find all your favorite premium movie channels in one place, like HBO, bringing you a new movie premiere every Saturday night, 52 weeks a year, guaranteed. Plus more Hollywood hits all week long, HBO original movies, and award-winning series. Showtime is known for its Hollywood hits, Showtime original pictures, and movie premieres on Friday nights. There's also Showtime championship boxing and ongoing adult series. You'll never see an R-rated movie on HBO Family, an exciting new network designed with movies and programs your family can watch together. You'll also receive multiple channels of Cinemax, the movie channel, plus Flix and Sundance channel. During your free month of USSB Entertainment Plus, you'll receive two free issues of the USSB Edition TV Guide. Remember to take advantage of your free month and sample as much of USSB's amazing lineup as you can. So call 1-800-204-USSB when you have finished installing your dish. We'll turn on your free month right away, and you can begin watching our great movies tonight. Call 1-800-204-USSB. Hi, I'm Steve, and you're about to watch me install a digital satellite system. I've got my self-install kit. Now, don't worry, in this video I won't go into every minute detail, but I will highlight the basic steps of an installation, and give you pointers on making the job go smoothly, and provide you with some helpful tips along the way. Now, I know it's tempting to dive right in, especially if you're good with home projects, but I can assure you, the time you spend here with me will make the job of installing your digital satellite system easier. And who knows? You may even have a little fun. Come on. Okay, first, plan several hours to properly complete the installation. Also, note the weather forecast. It's not advisable to do this in wet weather or in any threatening conditions such as lightning or high wind. Now, before we get started, let me tell you a little about the video. The program is a good overview which answers the most often asked questions about installing a digital satellite system. It's specifically designed to help familiarize you with the process and to help you understand the terminology used in the manual. And it's easy to follow. If you want to review a specific chapter, simply rewind or fast forward using the color-coded chapter headings for reference. Or you could just look for the matching color-coded icon in the lower right-hand corner to quickly identify which chapter you're on. In the following chapters, we'll cover everything from digital satellite technology to proper grounding technique. Now let's make sure your kit is complete. You may want to pause here to check your kit contents. It should contain a stereo AV cable, S-video cable, 
two RG6 cables, telephone cord, silicone sealant, dual grounding block, grounding wire, a compass, connectors, installation hardware, and of course the how-to video. Your installation kit also includes a self-installer manual, listing all necessary tools for proper installation, and detailed descriptions of each part of the process. You should use this as your step-by-step -step reference during installation. Now, we're ready to talk about how digital satellite technology works. Your digital satellite system probably resembles this one, and it should include the satellite dish antenna, the L&B, or low noise block converter, the mast and foot, and the receiver. You've probably heard all of this talk about satellites, digital signals, receivers, and compression. And other than giving you countless choices of entertainment options on your TV, what does it all mean? Well, it's really quite simple. And having a good understanding of how the technology works will be useful as you install your system. The signal that gives you the picture on your TV is actually transmitted to the dish from a satellite in a geostationary orbit about 22,000 miles above the equator. The satellite, although locked in its position in space, rotates at the same rate as the Earth, always remaining in its relative position to the Earth. Thus the term geostationary orbit. This geostationary orbit is why you don't need to adjust your satellite dish antenna every time you tune to a different station or program. The signal originates from an uplink center or broadcast facility. It is transmitted to the satellite and then relayed back to Earth to be captured by your satellite dish antenna. From the antenna, the L&B converts the digital signal and sends it through the RG6 cable into the house and to the receiver. Once there, the receiver decodes and processes the digital signal and sends the clean signal to your TV. It's important to note that the signal coming in from the satellite dish antenna out to your satellite receiver is a digital signal. The type of connection and the quality of your television and other electronic components will determine the actual quality of the picture and sound you see and hear. Okay, since I know you want to get that terrific picture on your TV as soon as possible, Let's move on to the next step, how to select a site for the satellite dish antenna. Now it's time to decide exactly where to mount the satellite dish antenna. Considerations for this step include safety, line of sight to the satellite, and the surface and sturdiness of the mounting surface. Now, locating the satellite and selecting the site for the dish are key in planning for proper installation. Your geographic location will determine the azimuth and elevation in relation to the satellite, and in turn, how to position the dish. Now, to find the location of the satellite, you'll need a compass and your manual. First, you need to determine the azimuth bearing, which is the place in the sky where the satellite is positioned, and the elevation which is the up and down angle at which the antenna needs to be pointed to receive the signal. The installation manual describes several ways to do this. Now, I'll be using the map and chart in the book along with the compass. The map tells you latitude and longitude coordinates based on your geographic location. The chart uses these coordinates to give you the proper azimuth and elevation settings. So, when the red needle of the compass points to magnetic north or the zero mark, the azimuth settings will be the same as the numeric markings on the compass dial. If you've done this correctly, you should be able to receive an initial signal once your dish is up and connected. The best plan for my installation is to mount the dish on the side of the house, a vertical mount on a wood surface. This is one of the most common and easiest types of installations. And since it's not out in the open, well, I have some protection from the strong winds. Future construction and tree growth are additional considerations. So at this location, I need to make sure that the trees won't get in the way once they start growing. And it looks like I'm okay. The manual has some very helpful information about why some sites are better than others. So be sure to refer to it as you select your site and mounting surface. 
Now, since I'm mounting the dish on the side of the house here, the cable routing will be relatively easy and short. As you lay out your cable routing, decide where you want to put your receiver inside the house. This determines the total length of cable required. Other important considerations at this stage include the entry point of the cable into the house, the location of the central building ground for your home, and whether or not you'll be connecting an off-air antenna or a cable television line. With your site selected, your mounting surface determined, and your cable routing plan in place, it's time to mount the foot and mast. Well, I'm ready to mount the foot and mast. Mine will be a vertical wood mount on the side of the house. There are several options for mounting surfaces, including panel siding, several styles of lap siding, brick, cinder block, deck railing, roofing, chimney, or a pole. Uh, just make sure that the mounting surface you choose is structurally sound, well, not only for safety, but for optimum system performance. Okay, the tools I'll be using include a ladder, a drill, different size drill bits, a bubble level, multiple size wrenches, a pencil, and of course, my safety glasses. If you plan to drill into brick or cinder block, be sure to use tools made especially for that purpose, such as a hammer drill. And whenever you plan to drill into any wall of your house, be sure to first identify where electric and plumbing lines are positioned inside the walls. Finally, prior to drilling inside the walls of your house, take steps suggested in the manual to prevent drilling more holes than necessary. As you mount your system, consider safety and avoid contact with overhead power lines, lights, and power circuits. Contact with these may be dangerous. Well, one final check ensures a clear line of sight to the satellite and a safe installation surface. My ladder is secure and safety glasses are in hand. So I'm ready to begin mounting the foot and mast. Now, near the area on the wall that was selected in the site survey, locate the stud. Now, one easy way is to find a vertical row of nails. Next, align the center holes on the mounting foot with the center of the stud. Then you can use a pencil to mark the top hole of the mounting foot so you know where to drill. After you've drilled the hole, use a lag screw to attach the mounting foot to the wall. Now, don't tighten this screw completely so that the foot may be positioned as it's leveled. Now, level the mast horizontally. I'm using a bubble level for this. All right, that looks good. Now, it's important that during the installation, you always grip the mast by the post around its circumference, like this, keeping your fingers away from the foot. Okay, let's double check this level. Looks good. Now mark the position of the foot. Now you need to loosen the two nuts holding the mast to the mounting foot. Move the mast down to access the lower center mounting hole and align the mounting foot one more time. Make your mark. Good. Next, drill a pilot hole here and insert a second lag screw. Double check that the mast is level horizontally and go ahead and tighten up both the bottom and top lag screws. To help prevent movement of the system in strong wind, secure the four outside corners of the foot by drilling pilot holes and then inserting the four lag screws. The last step for mounting the foot is to level the mast vertically and tighten the nuts. Okay, we are ready to move on to the dish assembly. At this point, the installation is about uh, one-third of the way complete, and I'm ready to assemble and install the satellite dish antenna. As you work with the dish, be careful not to scratch it. Now, since my installation is fairly high, it makes sense to assemble the dish on the ground. Now, place the L and B support arm bracket onto the back of the dish, lining up the four studs on the dish with the holes in the bracket. Fit the nuts and washers on the studs, and then go ahead and tighten them up. While you still have the dish on the ground, set the elevation. 
For me, it's 40.5 degrees. Now, this is the elevation setting that was determined by the map and chart in the site selection chapter of the manual. Now I'm ready to mount the dish on the mast assembly that we put up earlier on the outside wall. Use caution when handling the dish and mast, especially when working on a ladder. To mount the dish, simply slide the mast clamp of the LNB support arm over the mast. Don't completely tighten the azimuth bolt yet. That'll be done later when fine-tuning the signal. Now, although the system looks finished at this point, it is missing a key component, the LNB. The LNB installation is next. Before you begin, determine how many cables you'll be installing into your home. The model you purchased may have a dual output LNB, which allows for digital satellite reception on two receivers from just one satellite dish antenna. Also, consider whether or not your cable routing requires you to bury the cable underground. Now, if so, make sure the cable you bury is specifically made for that purpose. Now, to properly attach the LNB to the support arm, First, take the RG6 cable and peel about three feet of messenger wire from one end of it, which should allow for enough cable to reach the LNB from the mounting foot. Feed the RG6 cable up through the mast and then out through the LNB support arm. Now, thread the coax cable into the LNB connector. If it isn't waterproofed, well, you should seal this connection. A silicone sealant is recommended. Next, slide the end of the LNB into the rectangular opening of the LNB support arm. Find the hole in the bottom side of the LNB support arm and align it with the hole in the LNB. Now insert the LNB bolt and secure it. With the LNB secured, you're ready to finish routing the coaxial cable and ground the system. Properly grounding each component helps protect both the digital satellite system and other electronic components from lightning damage. So pay close attention to this step. First, take the long piece of messenger or ground wire that was separated from the LNB's RG6 cable. Clip it to length and then strip the insulation from the end of it. Now attach it to the ground terminal on the foot. When choosing the point where the cable will enter your home, consider the location of your home's central building ground. Some acceptable central building grounds listed in the manual include grounded interior metal cold water piping, a grounded metallic service raceway, grounded electrical service equipment enclosure, and a ground rod. The manual also provides detailed information about the National Electric Code and central building grounds. It's a good idea to review this section of the book before routing the cables and installing the grounding block. But remember, if you're ever in doubt, don't hesitate to call a professional electrician. Now, the placement of the grounding block should allow for as short and straight a ground conductor as possible. Since the grounding block also needs to be placed near the central building ground, it would go somewhere in this area. After securing the grounding block to a stable mounting surface with two screws, take the cable coming down from the LNB and bring it down to connect it to the grounding block. Now, you want to leave enough slack here to form a three to five inch drip loop. The drip loop allows for water to run down the cable and then drip off of the cable away from the connections. Now, connect the RG6 cable to the grounding block. Insert the messenger wire into the ground terminal on the grounding block. Now, insert the ground conductor wire in the grounding block's ground terminal, and then go ahead and tighten the terminal screw. Next, you need to route the ground conductor and connect it to your central building ground. And once done, the satellite dish antenna, the LNB, and the coaxial cable are now all grounded. Now take the other coaxial cable, the one that will be routed into the house, and attach it to the grounding block. 
Now, before you finish routing the cable into the house, it's a good idea to check all of your exterior connections to make sure that they're tight. And finally, to prevent cables from hanging loose, use cable clips and secure the cables to the wall, including this section that forms the drip loop. Well, we're ready to move into the house. Let's go. Earlier, I drilled the hole and routed the cable into the house. Now, depending on where you mount your dish and where you place the receiver, cable routing could go through the wall, the basement or crawl space, or up in the attic, and then through an inside wall to reach the rear of the receiver. What I'll be showing you is the most basic hookup. But you may have custom components or other special considerations, so make sure that you have the proper connections and cables for any custom outputs and connections. And of course, refer to the manual for the options that will be best for the components you have. Also, be sure to be familiar with the receiver before making any connections. Now, find the satellite in jack on the back of the receiver. This is where the cable coming into the house from the satellite dish antenna is connected to the receiver. Next, connect the coaxial cable to the out to TV jack. The other end of this cable is then connected to the coaxial input on the television. Okay, it's time to connect the receiver to the telephone line. Find the phone jack connection on the back of the receiver and insert the end of the phone cord. Take the other end of the telephone cord and insert it into the jack on the wall. Now, if there isn't a phone jack near the receiver, well, you have two choices. Install a new phone outlet or you could use a wireless phone jack such as this one. The in from antenna jack allows for a local feed, and the other connections on the back of the receiver provide you with a number of output options. Remember, you can refer to the guide for details on the proper usage of these connections. Note that the access card must be inserted to properly operate the receiver and digital satellite system. With the basic connections in place, it's time to acquire and fine tune the signal. With the dish receiver and TV hooked up, you should have an initial signal on your TV. Use the directions in the manual that accompanied your satellite system to find the receiver's signal strength screen. The screen probably resembles something like this. The dish should already be pointed in the direction of the satellite. But if you have no signal at all, well, double check your elevation and azimuth coordinates. Chances are, though, at this stage, you only need to adjust the azimuth. Now, fine-tune that signal by monitoring the signal strength screen on the TV and adjusting the position of the dish. The self-install manual describes several methods of doing this. You'll want to find which one works best for you. Come on, let me show you how I'm going to do it. I'm using what I call the point-and-shout method, which requires two people. One person checks the signal strength screen on the TV on the inside, while the other adjusts the dish on the outside. As you move the dish, the person inside shouts to tell you whether the signal is better or worse. Okay, now since the azimuth has already been set and you've already acquired the initial signal, mark the mast at this position for your starting point. Now, fine tune by rotating the dish in smaller increments to the right or left, while the person on the inside monitors the signal strength. Although it's possible to get a perfect signal, it's unlikely, due to a variety of factors, including atmospheric conditions. So your goal here is to try to get the best signal strength possible. When you're confident that you've achieved the best possible signal, tighten the bolts that secure the azimuth and elevation adjustments. You should refer to the troubleshooting section of the self-installer manual for more details on fine-tuning the signal. It's important to have patience when tackling this job especially at the point of fine-tuning the signal. The payoff is terrific. A clean picture and the variety of entertainment options that a digital satellite system provides. Well, there you go. We've now covered the basic steps for a proper installation. Now, this video is intended to be a supplement to the manual, not a replacement. 
I hope it's eased any concerns you may have had about installing your digital satellite system yourself. The information provided in the video and the manual is intended to help prepare you for the job. Now, it's important to plan enough time. I'd say give yourself several hours and use the right tools. Also consider safety issues for a proper installation. That's real important. Well, now that you have a good understanding of what to expect as you install your digital satellite system, the installation should go smoothly. So I tell you what you do. Take a look at your self-installer manual, get your tools together, and get started. Listen, you might even invite the gang over tonight for a premiere showing, just to say, yeah, the picture's great. That's because I installed it myself.